want to welcome everyone to your city hall. Uh, it is August 2nd, 2022, and it's just at 4 p.m. This is our work session for today. Um, we see that we don't have a quorum yet for our TRC commissioners, but I welcome each of you that are here now. Um, we will go to the next agenda item and then we'll get back uh, later. So the next agenda item is Johnson County Direct Assistance Program. And so we will um, start that uh, conversation at this point. Um, we uh, know through some of the memo that we've received and through communications that uh, um, the county has finished um, the, that process. Um, and then uh, there were great opportunities for people in our community that um, did get awarded some funding, but there was certainly a, uh, some that got left out. And so at this point, I wanted to just open up the floor to the community, um, to the counselors to um, maybe just discuss this. There was um, kind of a memo that we had, but um, I'll just open it up now. Okay, fine, I'll start. There's <laughs> um, the, I mean, I think the, go the overall goal of the, of the county project <clears throat> was to make sure that, that people who largely, but not solely, people who are not eligible uh, for, for stimulus funds um, and who had w really worked hard through the pandemic and, and suffered would get something. Um, the, I don't think that the way the program was constructed was ideal. It, what um, sort of the money we agreed, sort of, we didn't end up with exactly the deal that we thought we were getting. However, I would really like to find a way to make the rest of the 319 people whole. Um, if that means we pay a part of it, the county pays a part of it, whatever we end up with, Basically, these, these people have served everyone. They've worked for everyone. Even if they don't live in Iowa City, we've all benefited from them. Um, it's a one-time thing. Uh, I don't think Iowa City should bear the full burden, but nonetheless, one way or another, I would like to see us figure out, together with the county and other governments, how to make them whole. I would second that, Janice. Just, um, I had said it to some community members, but I'll just repeat it here, that I would very much like to resolve this in a way that helps those who are excluded and that we help in the way that we began with a collaboration. Um, and so I certainly hope that we can work something out. I believe that um, there there is a way to do this. Um, and I just, we don't want to exclude people anymore. And I'll, I'll agree with um, my two previous council members, because to be honest, I was very disappointed uh, to learn that there were individuals uh, who did not receive any of the funds. Um, I, I have appreciated the emails and the public comments about this, but what I don't appreciate, and I've said this many times before about other things, that being demanded uh, to do something, and we did receive uh, emails that demanded us to fund all 100, 319 of the persons not funded. Uh, demanding is not the way to go about wanting something. It has a very aggressive tone to it. Uh, asking or requesting has a much better effect. And I do believe that those persons who should have qualified for funding should receive it. But I don't believe that Iowa City should be 100% responsible. We were provided a lot of information regarding the disbursement of the funds uh, that included a lot of legal terms. <laughs> so it was kind of hard to get through all of it. Uh, but it also stated many times that this was for Iowa City residents. Uh, but after reading more closely, there is a clause in the subrecipient agreement dated 4-19-22 that mentions uh, unused funds. On page 31 of the information packet, packet under item 3, it states that the city may otherwise direct the disposition of such remaining funds as the city and the subrecipient may mutually agree. So as mentioned, I, I would hope that we could uh, agree with um, other entities on what to do with these re uh, remaining funds. Um, there are two scenarios that 
Uh, I'll just mention that I'd be in favor of and hope the county would agree. Uh, first is Iowa City funding those individuals uh, living in the near fringes of Iowa City. Um, from what I've been told, there are a number of them that uh, live in those mobile home courts that are just like across the road from, from the Iowa City city limits. And those folks are already being hit by uh, being their trailer court being bought out by another entity and uh, possibly having their lot rents raised. So they're already in dire need of, of extra funds. So I would be in favor of that. Uh, other scenario would be Iowa City funding 50% of those individuals um, who were not funded, uh, possibly meaning reimbursement to the county for those Iowa City uh, residents that were funded, potentially giving additional um, resources back to the county for disbursement. But whatever we do, as the other councilors have mentioned, we, we just can't leave anyone behind uh, struggling uh, to get their feet back on the ground. I would like to say that I would be uh, it, very comfortable with either one of those options um, uh, that uh, um, uh, Pauline was just mentioning and, and agree with, with uh, pretty much everything that's been said uh, thus far. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think either one of those, whether we look at uh, you know something in a zone around well, the annexation zone that we already sort of see as maybe future parts of Iowa City or just if we want to just keep it simple, just you know, see if the county would be willing just to split it and we would reimburse them for half that number and they could use, use that to, uh, you know, agree to use that for the other people that, uh, you know, the other half that wouldn't, that would need to be done and, county and get that done. Yeah, so. I too share the, you know, the, I think the sentiment of council, which is that <clears throat> we're not there yet. We have 319 uh, households which which we need to address, and um, we won't we won't be complete with this element of the program until we do that. Uh, I certainly hope we can work uh, together, and, and would expect, in a sense, that we, since we've you know aspired to work together um, with with the other entities in terms of trying to solve this problem. Uh, or problems in the past that we will apply the same approach to this particular problem. You know, I might add, um, you know, I'm trying to think of as many scenarios that we might want to consider and, and explore as possible. In, in addition to the entities, uh, the cities and the county, you know, I, I would ask the people of Johnson County as a whole, how can we all as citizens of this county, as residents of this county, contribute to addressing the, the gap that we have in the funding. Uh, I think there may be some possibilities there. It was, in a sense, used with the federal funding um, through uh, CWJ, where uh, people were asked to contribute, if they receive that funding, to contribute it back to CWJ. Um, so perhaps there's an opportunity for all of us to, in any way we can, help bridge this gap, this funding gap. Um, I personally would feel better if that were the case, that, you know, we, if we, if we do believe this is in a sense a, a kind of a moral imperative that we all understand that we may have a role to play with this. But I, I am hopeful that we will, in the end, be able to resolve this issue. I agree with my colleagues that our intent was to get the money to those who are eligible for the program and hope that we can move forward to do that. I think for the sake of trying to um, come up with something concrete and be able to move forward quickly, I would just propose that we say 50%. Um, rather than having to delineate an area and you know select specific applicants within a geographic area, I think we know what the gap is now and just um, if, if the council agrees, offer to fund 50% with the understanding that because we made the commitment to um, Iowa City residents that that would mean kind of backfilling a portion um, so that the county funds could then be freed up for those unpaid county residents and the Iowa City money could come in um, for the Iowa City residents that would be equivalent to half of the remaining portion. Great. Well. Um, thanks to all of the counselors that have spoken and 
I would also agree that, you know, at this point, we certainly have an opportunity that I think we should navigate. Um, we, I do believe that um, having some agreement with the county or having discussions with the county or giving the county a proposal to see what their temperament is for this or um, I, I think is a wise choice. At this point, I'm trying to figure out, you know, there's a, a few things that I heard, um, um, you know, trying to figure out how many, how we can fund individuals close to the adjacent to the city limits. I heard a 50-50 split. Um, I, I think if we're going to move forward with uh, something that we should maybe direct our staff um, a little more specifically to have the discussion um, with Johnson County, essentially they're gonna, the supervisors will have to have that discussion. Um, but maybe there will be some opportunities where, um, you know, we can certainly um, create a letter uh, on behalf of, I can, you know, create a letter with uh, staff support on, on behalf of the counselors and just open up the opportunity for solutions to be created. Um, and I, you know, the supervisors meet a little more often than we do. So I think we'll have some time for some correspondence between, but um, if there, it, it does sound like I've not heard anything more than a 50-50 split. Um, and so my thought is that we would um, move forward, try to figure out what is the, um, what would the county agree to? I heard, you know, the backfill option um, where essentially we would pay because um, the funds have already been allocated to all of the individuals that has been funded. But essentially the city of Iowa City would pay for um, half of the 319 Iowa City residents. Um, well, half of 319 is what we would pay for, but it would be credited to Iowa City residents because as everyone knows, our ARPA funds cannot be used by uh, anyone that is not within our jurisdiction. Um, the other part that I probably just want to, so does it sound good that we'll kind of move forward with drafting a letter, I think, um, and then giving it to the county and then there'll be some communication between now and then. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd suggest that we, that we um, request that staff be in touch as well to, as you, as you indicated. Yes. Yes. And that we also try to <clears throat> find a common ground of um, just let's get this done. As Laura mentioned that, you know, with a sense of, if not urgency, although I guess urgency is the right thing, but let's just get it done. We don't need to do the back and the forth and the back and the forth that, that drew this out painfully for everybody who is involved. Um, so, you know, we know that they're eligible already. They've met the criteria. Let's just see what the county can do, um, is willing to do in terms of a collaboration. Um, and again, uh, the way the lottery happened was not necessarily ideal, but we did um, get a large number of people covered and now we just need to close that gap so that our intention and our actions are the same, so. If, and if it turns out that, that there needs to be some kind of special joint meeting in order to accomplish this, I'm fine with that as well. Whatever, whatever works. Whatever it will take, yeah. To move this forward. Okay. One thing I did want to just mention, um, you know, when I read through, because we all saw what um, uh, Councilor um, uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor <laughs> I was going to say Thomas, but Councilor Taylor had just uh, talked about uh, that resolution. And so when I read through the resolution, I, I do want to make it very clear in my statements to uh, the council as well as to the public that we lived up to our agreement to a T, uh, the, the city did. Um, the, the agreement was to, you know, for everyone in the county, this was a county initiative, you know, go up and be a part of the lottery. And then anyone remaining that didn't make the lottery that lived in Iowa City would get funded. I also wanna say that um, the county, from my perspective, did everything to the letter as well. So they knew exactly how much money they had, um, and they knew they followed the direction that was 
you know, the information that was given to the public. So I, we have a lot to be proud of here. I think we, um, and that's the message that I don't hear ringing through the community. Um, but we have a lot to be proud of. We're the only one in the entire state that has done this program. So um, we know that there's individuals that are, haven't been funded. And this is an opportunity that, opportunity that we see. Um, Iowa City, in my opinion, again, we don't have any um, financial obligations to it, but we will, from the sound of everyone up here, we will go that extra mile to make sure that we can participate in a resolution. And so I, I just wanted to make that um, statement. And again, to everyone that's been funded, I think the county and the city were very uh, happy that we were able to do this. Thanks to the government that gave us the ARPA funds to make this possible. Um, and now we're trying to get to the last mile. So um, I would ask for grace and uh, patience uh, from the community members while we navigate this opportunity with the county, should they uh, be receptive to it. Anything else on this item? All right. We're going to move back to our first item on our agenda, which is a joint meeting with the Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I want to welcome all of our commissioners uh, here today. We do have a quorum, uh, so super excited that you all are here with us today. Uh, the topic that we have on hand is certainly that of the budget, um, and so we um, want to go forth in the budget. I also want to mention that we know that there is a um, uh, kind of a, a, a hot topic at hand um, with one of the commissioners, Amel Ali. What I'm going to ask is that we focus in on the budget um, and then uh, collectively I think we're going to not be able to speak on that topic, um, one for timing, but also uh, the council has different um, the council and the commissioners have different levels when it, uh, of authority when it comes down to any commissioners. And so I think that topic is probably best um, left out of this conversation at this point. But we do want to go forth with our um, with the budget discussion. Uh, all of the council did receive um, in our information packet um, the budget proposal. And so um, I guess I'll look to our new vice chair to maybe start the discussion. But before we do that, I just wanted to maybe give the uh, opportunity to all of our uh, commissioners to um, just introduce yourself very briefly. I know it's been a while since we've been together. Uh, you probably know most of the counselors, at least I know uh, most of you on a more personal basis. but. Maybe just give a brief little um, um, hello to each of us and give us your name. And I know some of you are, aren't in Iowa City, so tell us where you live. Hi there. Thank you for having us this evening. I'm excited um, for us to have this discussion. My name is Kevo Rivera, um, and I live in Iowa City. Mohamed Triori, formerly of South District until uh, I think it's February 2021, now in Tiffin, Iowa. Great. Cliff Johnson uh, here in Iowa City, and thank you for having us. Chastity Dillard, thank you all for having us, and I live in Coralville. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Daniel, and I live on the east side of Iowa City. All right. Welcome to all of you. And I think we'll just jump right into the budget discussion. Awesome. Um, again, thank you all for um, having us here, inviting us here to have this uh, budget proposal discussion. Um, we went back and did the work that you guys all asked us to do um, over the last um, few months, and we are excited to present this proposal to you. Um, we are hoping to have this conversation to unite us all to be on the same um, foot so that um, as we move forward, we can start to do the work or continue to do the work that we set forth off. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly read what we have that you all already have, and then we do have our partners here, and they're the most knowledgeable, so I'm gonna let them answer all of your questions, if that's okay. 
Uh, so the proposal that we have is uh, actually a set of four proposals from four different groups, as you already know, um, Think Peace, Kearns and West, Three Native Partners, and the Healing Partners team, which is our local team here. And um, we recognize that the skills and expertise of these, each of these group members are interdependent and necessary components to continue the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, what we have uh, decided is the best, or um, what the proposal is going to present is that we would like a phased approach, um, giving knowledge that we are uh, supposed to be ending next June. Um, so the, it's, a co, uh, it's two, pa two phases. Um, to co-create a framework and process the um, a process that reflects intentionality, and it's important to recognize um, and include more local partners and have this phase approach from which to evaluate our progress. Um, the two uh, phase approach is going to occur in three to four month interviews, uh, interviews intervals, um, and we will use that time frame to evaluate next steps. So we do have some of our partners in the audiences in the audience, but we would love whatever questions you all have started to start off. I know I would be would love to hear a little bit more how you broke down the phases and what we could expect uh, under this plan. Could you say it again? Oh, I'm sorry. I would love to hear a little bit more about the phases uh, in a little more detail and what we could expect under this plan. Okay. Um, so I would love to invite our partners that are in the audience to come explain this in more detail. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Counselors and TRC. Wonderful to be here. Um, my name is V. Fixmo Rise, and I'm the CEO and founder of Estig Planning. Um, I actually am part of a team, uh, the the local healing team. Um, so. I have one of my partners here as well um, and somebody else who is on vacation because it's summertime. Uh, so I can kind of go through some of the, um, the phases as you asked for. And then we also have another partner here. So I have Annie Tucker who's on our team, Angie Jordan who's also on our like local team. And then um, we are fortunate to have Dave Raglan here who is with Think Peace. Um, and I believe Kearns and West is listening in. So <laughs> maybe I'll get a text message, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So as you know, Chastity had kind of mentioned, this really is moving at the speed of trust. Really, um, we had kind of gone back to folks, the TRC and city councilors and the community to hear, you know, after that first and second time, like what would be something that could actually move forward at a pace that was, you know, manageable. Because uh, we kind of kept hearing that, that the chunks were too big, um, that, you know, it's too, too much, too soon, too fast. So um, kind of centering that, we really looked at a phased approach. And this first phase is uh, really about education. So TRCs are international. Um, there is a lot, I think, for really our community to learn and understand when it comes to truth and reconciliation commissions. What is it? How do they get started? What does it mean? Um, to actually go through the process to, uh, you know, have uh, what does it what does it mean when you're talking about having kind of like public hearings? Um, why is that important? Uh, there there are a lot of uh, really deep conversations and education uh, that will be kind of that first phase, as well as. Um, beginning some of that data collection. So we do kind of have another partner, Kearns and West, who will be starting the, the data collection aspect of things, you know, working with the city school, you know, our school district, um, the police, uh, hospitals, you know, all of the groups, nonprofits, um, you know, and, and community members. What is the data that we're looking for? Um, that's really some of their expertise. And um, I should say that the education is, and the truth telling team is Think Peace, so they, um, I'll let Raglan, Dave Raglan talk about kind of their, their part um, and their you know, experience doing that internationally. Um, but then the, the local kind of Iowa Healing Reconciliation Team is us and then also three native um, uh, Iowans who are actually very exciting, like kind of co-creating what it would mean to do uh, restorative justice healing circles that are specific to Iowa. Um, because we recognize that circles, uh, while they happen all over the world, do have a tendency to potentially um, have appropriation, and we want to make sure that we recognize that and really lean into that. So we, our team has really sought um, the inclusion of and sort of leading by uh, Native folks. Um, how can we co-create something that is truly authentic to Iowa, to here and now, in this moment? 
so that will be kind of kicking off and forming that at the same time. So that's that first three phase. And we have this phase also to provide a pause. So after we kind of do that initial phase, we would like to come back and have some recommendations for moving forward to the second phase, knowing that we may need more time. There may be things that come up, things shift. If COVID has taught us anything, like everything is a draft. So, you know, there's, there's going to be some things that we may want to, to shift and, and, and deal with. Um, so that's kind of that pause there, progress evaluation. And then shifting into that second phase, which is a little bit longer, um, as Chastity had mentioned, we really want to honor, you know, the, um, the kind of deadline of, you know, June um, with the commission. And uh, that second phase is really looking and digging more into the truth telling aspects. So conducting the interviews, the um, public, you know, the, the, the hearings, um, and also the, the fact finding. Um, so digging even, even more to that based on what we find out this first round. What more information do we need? Where do we need to go? What are we missing? Um, those kinds of things. And then continuing with the, um, continuing with the, uh, the healing aspect of it as well. We talk about reconciliation. Um, obviously, when people are telling about the harm that has occurred to them, there is an opportunity for healing um, in the moment and then also in, in long term. Uh, we also have here a strategic doing and planning that would be um, part of this. And um, myself and Angie Jordan are both trained in strategic doing, and we feel as though that may be a process to really kind of kick off some of the strategic planning. How do we take all this and move this into, you know, um, into the community? We recognize that three local partners is not nearly representative of the amazing talent, experience, and knowledge of people who live here and um, their expertise. So while it may be three of us to begin with, we also encourage you know, the creation of, you know, other groups and nonprofits that would be included along the way as those expertise are, are required. So the strategic doing would kind of help steer that a bit as well. Um, that's like a really broad overview. You can kind of see in your packet um, more specific breakdown in terms of who's doing what when. Um, and again, that phased approach is really meant to take those, those bites and then pause and see like what worked. Um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to come and talk about anything, or if you have any questions at, at this point. Real quick, I'm just intrigued by strategic doing. Could you explain that just a little bit? Yeah, strategic doing. Um, actually, uh, the Iowa City Area Development Group um, is a strategic doing hub here in Iowa City. And so myself and Angie Jordan were trained in basically a process that um, takes the assets and uh, people in the room that are here and says, what can we do with the assets and the people in the room that we have in this moment to move forward towards a larger goal? Um, usually it's like an aspirational goal, like you know, the best public schools in the country. <laughs> and then how do we get there? And so then people start gravitating towards smaller, <laughs> like low hanging fruit, so to speak, through a strategic process of, well, what would be like, you know, something very difficult, but also um, less expensive or what would be more expensive and less difficult. So you kind of go through this kind of weighing and measuring of uh, what do we have in the room? Where are we trying to go and how do we get there? And from that, you actually come up with Pathfinder projects. And that's where we would have like community members and groups and commission members, you know, kind of lead those Pathfinder projects. So yeah, it is very kind of specific, but in the end it's, it's like, um, it's like a fancy strategic planning in some sense. And then it looks like the last part of the phrase, um, the recommendations for moving forward, would that be the, the phase of recommendations to the council about what's next? It's kind of, that, that would be the end of the TRC ad hoc sort of mission at that point. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? So I think there's a couple points of recommendations. So after the first phase, we would have recommendations and then the second phase would have recommendations. I don't want to weight it too much to be like, and here's the be all end all final recommendations. But I, I think that's what we'd be working towards is what are the next steps? Um, because we recognize that, you know, hundreds of years of harm and, you know, having and the structural racism that we live within, seven months is not going to be enough, right? So what is, what is the long haul here? Um, I just wanted to add a note. Um, so Tom Banta uh, helped me go to the strategic doing training actually last May. 
Um, and wanted to add that I actually have a few Pathfinder projects that I wrote down at the time and then iterated on over the year. I can provide those as well for things to start you know, planning on. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, we're very fortunate in our community that I feel like every time I say strategic doing, somebody's like, what is it? And then somebody's like, oh, I know how to do that. So that's, that's great to have that um, expertise in our community. Thank you. Are you in, do you have a start date when you're, or tentative start date on this? Yeah, yesterday. No. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as possible, I think. Uh -huh. we're, and I want to stress that this, the reason why I believe the TRC wanted to make this session was because it's a draft. And so we're really hoping to get your feedback to make it better, to make it. So if you have a suggestion of a start date, you know, those kinds of things, like we're, that's what we're here to do. So the second, the second phase, as as it's currently envisioned, would be the the a lot of the the, the truth telling and, and and that because that wasn't when I was reading through this the plan that wasn't completely clear to me. Yes, that would be correct. Yep. Thanks. That was what I was slightly confused about too. Was where in this document uh, did it elaborate on community involvement? You know, such things as uh, forums and listening posts and those kinds of things. I wasn't quite sure. Where that where the community fit in to those kinds of things? Yeah, we will add that. Okay, thank good. You. Thank you. I actually have a question about the education piece. Um, when you talk about education, it sounds like that is a piece that is both inward. I mean, the work that the so that everyone is working from the same understanding, um, but then also that it would be frontward facing and community based as well to provide education for, I was wondering about audience, but it sounds like in your description it's both. Is that correct in phase one? That, that, is, that work will be happening as well. Yeah, that is my understanding and, and certainly um, Think Peace is the one who's going to lead that and could talk, Dave Ragland could talk more about what that looks like. My understanding is that it's exceptionally important that the entire community is educated as possible and that really there is, you know, a collective movement towards racial justice, um, that it can't just be the commission, that it has to be the community. It's my understanding. I guess questions I have for the uh, commissioners um, during your discussion, uh, what were some of the highlights that you all brought up as um, maybe some concerns that you can think of right now? Um, only thing for me is just, again, just time constraints, uh, just the reconciliation process in itself. If the true goal is reconciliation, um, just have a hard time seeing how that's completed at a specific date or time. It's really hard to say when someone feels like they've, you know, had the situation remedied to their satisfaction. So um, the main thing for me is just some kind of avenue after the TRC is completed to have some kind of permanent commission or some kind of permanent board that's overseeing this actual reconciliation process. Otherwise, it ends up being a list of recommendations without any real backing. Um, I'm not really sure how we can address that ourselves since we can't you know, say, hey, this commission's going to be permanent, but that's just one main concern. Something that concerned me, and our community partners did take this um, concern seriously, was the matter of transparency. We don't want anything that we do to be seen as this is merely the commission taking upon itself to give a recommendation to city council about what we think the community needs and how we think the community can move forward. Um, and I think our community partners have done a great job, um, and I'm I mean, you, they were amazing during the process of discussing this, and I'm sure if there are specific questions, they can answer them, but um, one, one way they uh, kind of dealt with that question of transparency is providing in the plan opportunities to, for us to, as, um, as both a commission and as the council, and maybe even as the community, to reflect on what has been done so far. So I believe after phase one, there's a moment where we kind of pause and reflect on this and then move forward. And I think that's so important when we're talking about something that not only brings up a lot of emotions, but could be controversial in some ways. So, yeah. One question that I had brought up um, and 
Um, I'm not sure how much progress has been made on uh, this. Was um, the you know, I think we have amazing partners so far, both that are locally based and experts in truth processes, and then also people who can take a lot of data and figure out how to um, really interpret that and, and make suggestions from there. Um, and so I see, um, you know, three experts who can really successfully um, do three different things. One question that I had was, okay, how do all those parts talk to each other, and how do they communicate alongside us with the city? And they had kind of answered that um, in the suggestion of a TRC commission coordinator position. As it stands in the packet, um, the suggestion would be that um, that person could be a part-time employee of the city, but I just wanted to see if we had any more updates on um, kind of what that might look like. Yeah, I don't think we had any further updates per se, but thank you so much for calling that out. Thank you. Um, so it is imperative, you know, when you're doing something that you have somebody who's doing the thing. And so um, as the work moves forward, having a local person that would, you know, reside with the city to do that, because it is a city commission, um, who could really focus on how do we coordinate all of the things. Um, it can't, you know, currently the commission, if they were to do things separately, you know, like how, who is bringing sort of what we call herding cats, you know, like how do you, how do you make sure that things are navigated? We have facilitation of meetings. We have meeting minute notes. We have, it's sort of the, I don't want to say the not sexy, boring stuff, but like some of it is, you know, um, and then also making sure that we're coordinating the where, when, who for the truth telling, for the events, for those kinds of things. It can't just be left to a commission when there's Lots of, as we said, if we do the strategic doing, there will be Pathfinder projects. There will be specific tasks that they aren't, you know, going to be a part of and, and leading, hopefully. Um, so the creation of this position, we feel, would be um, really in important and integral to moving forward. As you know, we have seven months to do this. Um, if I may. Um I think that how you've articulated it makes a lot of sense, that, that there does need to be sort of like a, a point of contact um, and certainly someone who can kind of um, facilitate and organize and project manage essentially throughout. I will be honest that my concern is that this is far more than a half-time job. Um, and even in going into the specifics of the budget, there were several instances in which Kearns and West noted, assumption is Angie will lead this, right? Yeah. That there's an awful lot of weight actually put on local partners, while I will also start to get into the weeds a little bit, that's not reflected in the budget. Um, yep. With all due respect to Kearns and West and their reputation, I think that their portion and what they're charging is heavily bloated. Um, because also they're saying, oh, but we're not going to coordinate that. We're just, we're going to, so I, mm -hmm. those are some concerns that I have. Um, I very much like the way in which there has been this true, deep, and hard, hardly fought collaboration with a lot of local input and a lot of listening. Um, I just, I wish that that was more reflected in what we have, because I fear that in fact the bulk of work will fall on local partners. I think it's gonna to fall to TRC. I think TRC needs to, it has an important role to play. And um, so I think that that's something moving forward. The awareness has to be there because right now the budget is not reflecting that at all. Um, and I do fear for the, the fact of the centrality of where this is happening, along with the passion and the expertise, that there will be a lion's share of work done by locals, which is fantastic, which is what the council, previous council wanted, but that that will not be reflected. And I think that in terms of thinking about equity, that that's something that really matters. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. In fact, you'll see that there are no, um, there's no rate for Angie in our proposal. Yeah. Um, there are hours allocated because we didn't feel like we could say what the city should pay that person. Um, so we, that is a good point to bring up, that um, when you're looking at our local partners, um, we are mostly focusing on the reconciliation aspect of it and the coordinator position 
we wanted to make sure that Angie was still a part of the process because she has been so integral since day one. Um, so that's why it's not reflected there. And we didn't know, we don't know the process for hiring or we don't know, you know, like all of that kind of logistic stuff. So that's, um, that's why that is missing. But I, I appreciate that you're really bringing that up. Um, and I will say, you know, in all honesty, having not done a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process before, we are really trying to stay in our lane. You know, as local partners, we're saying, here's what we can do. We can, we can hold these healing circles. We have restorative justice, you know, practices and can certainly convene and help. And then we are going to have to rely on a coordinator to kind of do the the herding of cats and, and the organizing and the scheduling and all of that stuff. But um, so yeah, to your point, that is not reflected in the budget, and the, so that would be something separate. And and I'm, we don't know what that is. Thank you, V, for that explanation of the coordinator position because I, I was a little confused about that, and and I did have concerns for it because. Uh, it seemed as though it sounded more like a facilitator, actual facilitator role. And, and in fact, in the description of the position, facilitator is mentioned many times. And so I was wondering why we actually, or why you needed a, a person in addition to that. But uh, aside from that, I wanted to thank the commission uh, and, and the partners uh, for this document, because this most recent proposal, I think, is what I wish we would have seen over a year ago, uh, rather than being given bold proposals over time uh, that weren't really very reasonable. Uh, this one is much more specific uh, and defines roles, which which is very good. Um, so my, my concern was about that coordinator position as well as the community involvement. Um, but this document certainly, I think, comes closer to what we as a council, I don't want to speak for my other council members, but uh, what we were interested in, in, in seeing to, to help get the TRC uh, back on track to their uh, original mission. Uh, but considering the remaining time frame, uh, it does seem a bit overwhelming. So uh, that, that would be my concern too with the time frame. I certainly want to um, make sure that council recognize we have the opportunity to speak to our TRC commissioners. Mm -hmm. And TRC, you also have the opportunity to speak to us. So please chime in. Mm -hmm. um, and the support of uh, you know the individuals here, we appreciate you being here. But I also want to make sure that it's, um, make sure that we have space to interact as well. Right. I would, uh, as part of this, I'd also be interested in hearing from Dave Ragland, who has a lot of experience in these, in, with these processes, to get a set, his, to get your sense of how these pieces fit together and 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 how we would move this forward. Um, for that, I just wanted to just ask for a clarifica uh, clarification. So I'm hearing that uh, I wish we would have had this proposal like a year ago. What are the specific parts that made it become more amenable? Because the Kearns and West part of it is pretty much the same format. It, it seemed to be more itemized as far as who all was going to be involved rather than just this massive facilitator, Kearns and West, was going to kind of be responsible for the whole ball of wax. But this itemizes and uh, okay. does some more as far as what Annie and her team would do and, and what you as, a, as commissioners would be doing and responsible for and a time frame. Before, I don't think we had much of a time frame. It was just sort of, this is what we're going to do. So I appreciated that, that it was spelled out that within this three months and then within four months. So that's what I found as, as much better and much more helpful. There's a lot of specificity that's that's very helpful, at least from my perspective. Welcome. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to honor this commission, this council, for doing this really hard and important work. Um, I think the things I want to speak to is like who we are at Think Peace, and um, just sharing that some of our formative experiences has been working in truth commissions around the world. Um, Chile, Argentina, Peru, um, also local commissions. We're currently working with San Francisco um, True Commissioner, uh, True Commission on Prosecutorial Misconduct. Um, I worked and helped to found the Ferguson Truth Commission with Congresswoman Cori Bush. And some of the other work that we're doing is working with Portland City Council and the mayor's office there. Um, and so we're essentially, we really wanted, um, um, I think in the last uh, few years, we've been seeing how 
necessary it is to defend democracy and to also heal as a nation. And the reason why we wanted to work with local commissions and have started working with local commissions uh, around the country is because we wanted to provide some of the support that commissions need to move forward to the next phase to do whatever they wanted to do. And some of the work that we've done already is we offered a course on the, the formal term of truth and reconciliation is transitional justice. And we offered a, a course where many of the commissioners um, attend it um, around what does a process look like from start to finish. Um, and we've been working with other commissions providing a hub space so that communities around the country can be in touch with each other as they do this work as well. Um, and um, one of the primary things that has come out of this work is providing technical assistance. And when we, the technical assistance as you see in phase one is focused on education. Um, and part of the education is to build capacity in communities to do this work themselves, right? Because we understand that we're, we're not gonna be here all the time, although we're committed to seeing what happens here in this community. Um, we're committed to uh, this community sharing its truths and reckoning with its past and present. Um, we know that there's only so much support that uh, we can do. And so over the last year, we've um, you know, spent lots of time talking to commissioners and supporting in whatever ways just from a uh, professional support uh, perspective. Um, and the primary work that Think Peace is doing, and Think Peace is a collaboration of the Truth Telling Project of Ferguson, of which I'm the co-executive director, um, and also um, Think Peace at George Mason University, as well as Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, led by, uh, or founded by Dr. Fania Davis, and led by other folks um, who've um, really uh, tried to champion truth and reconciliation as a process that our nation needs uh, to heal. We need a reckoning. We've never stopped to say, where are we? And that's what we're trying to help this community do, although this community is already doing important work around that. And so we're really interested in supporting that capacity building through education and technical assistance around helping um, lift and move forward the truth telling process, which includes public hearings. I think education is a part of that. We also support uh, ways to organize and ways for this commission to bring other people in this community into the circle. Um, I think as well, um, in the and that's part of the first phase. And the second phase, um, or the first phase also includes uh, fact finding, which is a part of that, and also supporting people who are telling their stories and truth telling in that way. Um, and so I'm, I can't say much more than V did, but I'm happy to offer uh, any responses to questions that I'm, as I'm sweating <laughs> up here. So thank you for hearing from me, and I'm open to respond to any questions that are, are there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raglan. Do you have any thoughts on the what Councillor Weiner was talking about as far as the bringing together the pieces and, and kind of having, when you have different partners working on a larger project and what that might, might look like? Um, I do. I, I think that, you know, already uh, we've been working um, together to support uh, what's possible. And I, I think that... Um, this is this feels like a large process with so many moving parts, and you know, number one, I support the the idea of um, a person here to help coordinate, um, but we'll be here and present um, and try to help fill whatever gaps that that are present to support connection among all the aspects of this process. Uh, we're committed to this, and. Um, I don't know how much more I can say about this. If you have some more specifics, maybe that can help me um, go deeper in. But you would, so you would also be providing technical assistance to whoever the coordinator is so that they can, they can successfully carry out that role, which is obviously a key role. Yes, definitely. 
Are, are you aware of any, uh, any other example of the kind of structure that is being proposed here that has, um, I know in, it most likely it's not gonna be so in every detail, but I'm always very interested in modeling and understanding through other precedents that you may be building the foundation of this process on that you could reference. Sure, there's, there's a number of processes right now around the country. Some have been more successful, some have uh, floundered, um, but one, one example that um, I am really appreciating uh, right now is the, the international model um, which looks at transitional justice as truth telling or these public hearings. I mean, so a basic model is truth telling um, or public hearings, um, truth seeking, um, the data piece, and then commissions go between reparations, particularly the, the process of transitional justice emerged as a direct response to gross crimes against humanity. Um, and so many communities needed some kind of reparations. Um, and many of them include or don't include reparations, but most are focused on truth. Um, most are focused on re reconciliation as a process. And so um, I'm just, I was trying to um, uh, um, see some other process I can, I can think about right now. But for instance, the state of North Carolina is currently organized to create a statewide process. And that emerged from the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation process that happened in response to the 1979 massacre where a multiracial group of um, activists were, uh, some were killed and injured, and the commission came together to try to change the way that the community viewed that happened. Essentially, the people who organized the rally uh, were the ones who were blamed uh, by the whole community uh, for that. And what this process looked like was a lot of organizing in the beginning and education using various forms. Uh, they did a play. They had public conversations. Um, there was a play that happened about the truth, about the 1979 massacre, and the community uh, put question, questionnaires at restaurants all around the city after the play. And that built public momentum for this community to have this process. And that process looked like multiple avenues for community healing. Um, so people were invited in, not just from the, the core group, but communities all over the city. Um, and that eventually turned out uh, to some real revelations and some real apologies about what happened. And I, I think that's um, probably extremely important to, to just face up to our past so we can move forward. And one of the things that they found in that commission was that the police had been complicit in sharing the parade protest route with the KKK and neo-Nazis, which was one of the first time in American histories that those two groups came together. Um, so one of the things that emerged broadly was recommendations from the city with, that went to the city from the commission that was essentially brought forward by a large community process of truth telling and healing, and people got a chance to hear sides that they hadn't heard before. And one of the things I like to think about is how Reverend um, Nelson Johnson sat down, uh, he's an African-American leader who helped initiate the commission, he sat down with a grand wizard of the KKK to have meaningful conversations. Um, and it shows that people, uh, for me, it shows that people who are seemingly on uh, various sides of issues or perspectives can have a conversation and that can be movement forward. I mean, it, it, this is probably just like not necessarily the purview of this meeting, but it strikes me that the, the context in which we're looking at this has shifted since 2020 and, and become 
more important, even more important overall for the community as we, and not just this community, but but communities in the state at large, as we see efforts um, in the state legislature and others to prevent people from thinking critically or or discussing the role of race or systemic racism, um, and you can't move forward without. You can't just put the, shove those things or sweep them under the carpet and be able to move forward as a society, and that the whole effort to to get to basically put a curtain up and say these these things don't exist really was not part of the conversation when we started talking about this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that we're in a very um, different political moment since uh, 2020, which I think requires us even more to confront what people are experiencing, uh, to listen, um, and to, be, to hear and be heard. And, and I, I, while I do think there are political elements, this, this process is really about healing and reconciling um, and transforming who we are as a, as a people, as a city, as a community. Thank you so much. Thank you yes. so much for having me. Great. Right. May I ask a question of the commission? So um, looking at the proposal, and I know there's been many hours that have been spent on it, um, two questions. One is, how confident are you as commissioners about implementing and executing and knowing full well in Mohammed, I thought you put it really well before that, it, I mean, it doesn't just arbitrarily end. The commission as a body might, or maybe it's not, but the work of reconciliation has to go on, and this is, uh, the purpose is to provide a mapping for steps that, of course, are gonna grow and evolve and whatnot, but to 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 have a framework in place with action in, in the seven months. Do you feel, as commissioners, do you feel confident in this plan and moving it forward. And then also, um, what roles do you see yourselves playing in this? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I, I really just want to start by saying thank you for your patience as we've been going through this process, right? Um, there have been a number of periods during our um, tenure on this commission that felt like we were just facing setbacks or pauses or what have you. Um, I think that by the end of the, my time serving on this commission, I will have realized that um, everything took as long as it needed to in order for us to be the best process possible. That being said, with the very specific um, plan that's been laid out, I do have um, some level of confidence that at least we can start setting up the frameworks um, for what can be implemented in this community um, in, in perpetuity. Um, um, because reconciliation will not happen on June 30th, 2023, um, but it will be an ongoing process, and I, I hope that we can do a lot of work to um, to, to uh, get the community involved um, and more knowledgeable about what those processes could look like and how they can be um, uh, a, a part of it. Uh, I basically, uh, <clears throat> I see things as uh, almost like a farm. We have to make sure that we tend to it, start it with seeds, and then let it grow. However we can help, however I can help, I'm willing to do it. So I think yeah, I have a lot of confidence in it so far. Um, I have confidence in, in it how, with how it's written so far, but with that being said, I'd also like to say that I also don't feel completely comfortable answering the question, as I don't feel I have uh, complete information. Again, it's unclear the amount of these resources that we're asking for that will actually be afforded, um, if this is the plan that you will accept or if you're looking for an amended one. So my answer would really depend on the amount of resources afforded and the, um, the level of support that would be uh, um, given to us, but also that would remain throughout the process. I appreciate that and maybe if I can give a few comments, um, maybe that'll give you a little bit of, <clears throat> um, I think most of the council has talked a little bit about this plan. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> so for me, um, one, I want to say thanks to all of the commissioners that are here and those that aren't as well um, at the work um, to pr present this to us. Um, there's been I've been I've been having lots of conversations and you know about you know the TRC and what and, and the mission. 
The one thing I will say is that I'm, I'm happy to see this proposal in this identifying one, what is the charges of the, th you know, the three charges, so I appreciate that. Um, the community partners was the biggest reason that I recall last year that this council said, uh, the majority of this council said no to the budget. Um, and it, it, the biggest thing that I remember about that is um, really the community involvement. And earlier this year, um, before you took your vote, I believe it was in March, for your next budget, the, the meeting before that, um, I remember Kevo's talking about phases, you know, for the commission to, you know, think about some phases. And then um, also Dr. Wangui, she mentioned, um, you know, you know, and the community partners were still there. Um, if, um, the Hill and partners, as well as the NATO partners, they were in, the three NATO partners, they were in that proposal. But Dr. Wangui said, you know, how much engagement have we reached out to the community um, as a commission? That, those are her words. And so while I, you know, look at this proposal and I think that there are some, um, some great elements, um, I look at Kearns and West, and I also hear that there is a, um, a, a really the need for a truth and reconciliation coordinator position. Um, and I would agree with Mayor Pro Tem Alter when she said, you know, reading through this, it does seem like a full-time job um, that that person will be doing. And so when I look at this, thinking about the role of the TRC coordinator, looking at what Kearns and West do, uh, which in my, which I read as a project manager, the role of Kearns and West, I almost see that role overlapping um, in a lot of respects. And so while, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to see that we're at this point. I want to make that very clear. Thank you all for getting to this point. Um, but when I see, you know, and it's, I'm not really, you know, if it takes a million dollars to, you know, process, to do this process, I'm all for it if it all makes sense, 100%. So it's not so much the money, um, but when I look at a non-community member, you know, getting 62.3% of the 388,000 that is here, it, it gives me a little pause to look a little further. Um, and if we're now going to look at, you know, this TRC coordinator position, um, someone said they didn't know what the process was. I think that was Chastity that said that before, you know, how do we go through hiring? What is the process for hiring? Um, I'll just give you a, a little snippet is that, you know, there would have to be a job description created. Um, this person would have a manager here, you know, at the city, city hall. Um, the other thing is that we cannot, that job must be posted, you know, to everyone and any and everyone can apply. Um, and at that point, you know, you know, the selection is made. Um, so when I look at just what Kearns and West is doing, where we're going, and as far as overlapping, I do, I, I would just want to be very transparent and caution the, you know, TRC to maybe look a little closer at you know, how does that project manager, that's what I see this as, as a project manager role. Is that something that you can achieve um, with, in someone local or within this role? So that's the only thing that I have. I, I am um, excited, um, you know, um, when I read about all that Think Peace can do and what they can offer us. Um, our healing partners, I know all of them, and so, um, I'm, you know, excited to know that they're a part. They're local community members that have been highly respected. Um, the Native partners I haven't met yet, but maybe when I see them, I'll know them. I, I don't know who they are. Um, but that's the only thing that I would say. Otherwise, um, I know that, you know, people have said um, there's value in having outsiders, and I, I hear that, I understand that. Um, there's value in having someone that knows this process. I hear that and I understand that, but I also know project management um, and the things that are there. 
um, I, I, I personally feel can be achieved um, through another process, but that's all I'll say. I can just add on. One of the things also that I noted in the Kearns and West was that actually they're, they're putting the research of these of the data collection on, on their backs, right? And so um, that they would be creating the database and whatnot. I mean, that I would tend to agree. It, it's a specialized skill, but it is something that I think that portion of the work could be done locally. I think it may make sense to to talk with Kearns and West or if they're on the line to to consider and um, that as they do the truth telling that it I mean, they would be more research oriented um, again I go back and, and in fact one of my points of confusion was looking at honestly sort of the, there's a number of meetings and I didn't know if those were solely of TRC meetings. I'm assuming, obviously, there's going to be more meetings than simply commission meetings. Um, but it's sort of there seem to be a lot of people who are going to be attending these meetings, and a lot of them from Kearns and West. And, and I don't doubt that they might all have be bringing their A game, and this person specializes in this. And da -da -da. Um, But I'm wondering if maybe a way to not impede progress and to not slow this up, I'm mindful that this also has a timestamp on it in the same way that we were talking about a sense of urgency with the direct assistance. Um, but I'm wondering if there is a way that maybe Kearns and West could own the content of the fact finding rather than the, the formatting of it all. Um, and I recognize that puts some more onus on some, some potential other partners. Um, but uh, even the University of Iowa, like there, there could be people who I think who might be able to be interns, do community outreach, work through the Oberman Center, perhaps. At any rate, um, I'm not here to solve, but I do. I don't want to offer criticism without offering up also a suggestion. Um, so, I do agree with the mayor in terms of the, the project management aspect of it, because that, unfortunately, that in a company, that's where there's a lot of billable hours. Um, and I do believe that they have, I sound just like the mayor, I do believe, um, but I do, that, that Kearns and West has a very specialized expert, um, you know, set of skills to be able to, to do that fact finding, to do the data work through the, all the different institutions and amalgamate them and interpret them. I would love for them to be able to do that work while shrinking their portion of the budget to the sort of the logistical aspects of it. Yeah, I really appreciate that comment. And um, there's actually been, you know, this whole process, kind of to Kevo's point, it's like everything has taken as long as it should have. <laughs> but we've get, we've gotten to know each other very closely these past six or eight or ten months, um, Kearns and West, Think Peace, and our local partners. And I feel like we put the, this draft, this is a first, you know, third, whatever draft in front of you. And then last week, um, after some input from the commission, we had another sort of like, hey, you're an all white company, um, primarily men that are taking s over 50% of the budget. Yes. That's problematic. And I, I want to just credit um, Dr. Raglan um, calling that out, because that's a hard thing to do. We've been working very closely with them. This is very tenuous. We already put a pause on it and changed the whole thing on them. <laughs> so we asked them to go back and change their rates, actually take the fact-finding aspect and maybe make it more local. You know, so they are, they're trying to work through that. Um, we've gotten some preliminary stuff. It, just timing-wise, we didn't feel like we had another full draft to present yeah. to you all today. But I just want you to know that some of those things we are pushing back on. That's great. Uh, because we need to. <laughs> it's like part of the process is if you're going to be doing this truth and reconciliation, it can't look like that. Yeah. It can't just be professionalized like that. Um, and we do have a lot of resources here in terms of fact finding. We already know that the, um, the school district does a lot of that already. So there's, I think, some assumptions that they had made um, that maybe we can, you know, take back, essentially. Um, so, but to the project management, I think it's a really great perspective to look at this through and actually could be very clarifying. So I've taken a ton of notes 
to add to and clarify, you know, community partners and a lot of the items that are listed, time constraints, uh, making sure that education is clear outward and inward, um, and uh, community involvement just needs to be more explicit. I will, I'm adding the project management aspect to it because I think that's probably actually a good lens for us to look at our partners and say, you know, if it's going to be this community coordinator position, this TRC coordinator position, is it enough? Because it is true when you look at Crimson West, originally that was their role. So there may be some of that still in there. And I think we need to clarify whose lane is doing what, because we quite frankly want that here. Um, and, I, and I know that that's what they can do because they're a professional organization, a professional company, and that's like their skill set. But we can do that here too. And so um, if you just, you know, give us a little bit more time, you know, it's nothing like a fourth or fifth draft to move forward, but this has been incredibly helpful and um, really just want to open the door to if you're thinking of something as you're brushing your teeth later, like definitely let us know um, because we want this to be successful. We want it to be reflective of the work that we can all do together and it's completely part of the process. I mean, I guess I would say that I, that I think that I mean, I'm glad you've gone back to them. I'm glad you've made those points. Um, I, I personally, um, uh, as this is refined, I personally think that we should be giving you, you all as well as the commission um, the space to say, we're going to, you know, the, the amount, the general amount of the budget is okay. So I'm just sort of setting down parameters, right? Sure. Possible parameters. And you're going to decide in the end how that how the how, how that's divided up so maybe because it takes a while to hire someone maybe kearns and west starts out doing essentially the coordination and the project management as someone is hired they they give the they they hand it off uh, they hand that piece off so that it is so that it's local but then things have already gotten started and the ball has gotten rolling in the, in this sense with um, with the people who have the, with with the people who have the expertise, and they hand that off, um, and then you potentially have you, you potentially have a lot of hours that then don't happen and are shifted to the local level. Um, but I'm um, I'm mindful of time, um, and I'm I'm concerned, and I'm also mindful of the fact that it's probably not. I don't view it as our job to micromanage it. Um, I would like I would like to see it as our job to set a, sort of overall parameters, and it sounds to me like you all um, in, in their various groups have a good sense of of the need for diversity and the need for uh, for the local for the local element to end up not only being prominent but also being paid, yeah. um, and to and to sort of say find those parameters um, go forward. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I think everybody is mindful of the time. And I know Angie Jordan isn't here. Um, I think she's taking some respite after finishing up the diversity markets. Um, but I will say that she has said this, so I feel like I can convey this, that she would be willing to volunteer her time uh, to ramp that up because she feels very strongly that it should stay local. I guess one, one other little question I would ask is, has staff, have you been in conversation with staff in terms of you know, some of these questions regarding the organizational structure, the role of the project manager and so forth? Um, we have talked with legal, I think, because mm -hmm. of any, um, you know, Angie Jordan's husband is a firefighter, and so there's been legal discussions about how she could be involved. Um, but in terms of project management, I think I'd need more clarity on what we would ask. Like, who's from the city perspective? Like, who would be a part of that or how we organize ourselves? I'm, I'm just, in terms of the review of the, the, the framework that has been developed here, it's a complex uh, organizational structure. You have four, four groups working, working together on a, on a difficult subject matter. Um, but I was just, you know, the staff has generated lots and lots and have reviewed lots of RFPs on projects, certainly not TRC, you know, a truth and reconciliation process, but are familiar with working on trying to knit together, you know, how how the how a team would be structured and how it might be organized in terms of role play, role playing, and so forth. Yes, we. It was have. just a question, but it seemed to me that you know they often will review the city's own consultant contracts. I don't. I was just really asking the question if they had been involved in this one in any way. Yes, we have had um, discussions with deputy city manager um, 
Redmond Jones mm -hmm. here, the, um, in terms of the complexity of having four entities on one proposal. I know it seems a little strange, but for us it really creates a more flattened playing field. Um, as before, we were all under one house, and so we felt like that um, needed to happen, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, so, but we were told that that's not an issue, that it's not, it's, un, it's not super common, but that it's been done before. I do just want to close my comments that I'm super encouraged um, by this conversation today um, and looking forward to when you all get back and deliberate, because I know there will be more con uh, conversations that you all have. So I just wanted to make sure that you all heard me say I really appreciate what you've done so far. So thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo that. Thank you to the commission and to local partners for the work. Uh, it's it's um, coming into this uh, halfway through the movie, I guess, uh, um, just starting in, on the council in January. It's good to see something uh, this concrete and this detailed um, in front of us as sort of a draft, right? So, so we understand that, um, uh, you know, this is kind of bouncing this off of and getting some feedback from council. Uh, so as I look at this, I had some of the similar things, wondering about some of the uh, uh, possible redundancies in, in work and effort between a local coordinator and uh, an outside facilitator or outside uh, uh, company like Kearns and West. So that would be something that as you go back and, and work through this, I would, would want uh, clarification and, and a solid you know, like rationale to support something like that. Because for all the, the reasons that have been mentioned, it sounds like, you know, um, a little bit of an imbalance there in terms of the way this budget and, and, and how it's structured, but it's definitely represents real progress. Um, very much appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Traore's uh, comments about this is not going to be a seven month solution. No, it's not. A, I don't think anybody ever expected that, um, but I'm looking forward too to um, seeing what, what comes out of this and how, you know, what makes sense for moving forward. And so that's a really good endpoint for. Um, you know, uh, this first big step that the city of Iowa City has taken and, and got underway, you know, before I was sitting up here. Uh, but, but again, thank you for the work that's been done. Uh, so happy to see some some concrete stuff and moving in, and moving in a direction uh, we can actually, you know, see some of these things start to happen, which was very exciting. I just have one question. I'm sorry, Laura, you were going to... I was just, I had a question for the, the commissioners as we've uh, been around this table before. And do you feel like you have what you need from the council as far as getting to the point of solidifying a proposal based on feedback so that we, you know, you haven't voted on this proposal, right? And so kind of getting to that point of saying, okay, this is what we want to give to the council for kind of the up or down vote. Are you feeling like you're getting what you need? Go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, I'll respond with an invitation. Um, as you are looking at this proposal more um, in the next coming days, um, please feel free to reach out to us um, with anything else that wasn't mentioned tonight. I think there was furious note taking um, on, on all of our parts uh, to make sure that we are um, clarifying, tightening, and adjusting things as uh, you have mentioned so far tonight. Um, we meet again on Thursday. Um, I'm not going to say what the outcome of that meeting will be, but hopefully um, if you do have any other comments, please feel free um, to let us know about them so that we can incorporate those into our discussion. Yeah, all I would echo is that um, as much input that you have that you would like to give us, we would certainly take it into consideration. We want this to work out, so we really just want to move this forward with you all with us. So thank you all for having us here. I also would like to say I agree. I, I, I think more communication between us only makes things smoother. I really appreciate your time. Um, appreciate your time. Would like to agree on the more communication piece, but I also just wanted to say I uh, got more clarity on some things, but still a little fuzzier now on some others. It's like the suggestion on bringing the university in of not really sure how that process would work, if the job posting would have to be underneath the university's umbrella or if it'd be underneath the city it or something. It was processing out loud, so <laughs> I did not uh, mean to okay, muddy yeah, waters. I was just not at all, not at all. Yeah, was, um, it was... It was it was processing. It was not a direct okay. suggestion. <laughs> of, yeah, just in terms of the total budget amount, um, just trying to learn a little bit more on the number of positions uh, within the actual city, if there's a critical number of people you're looking for, or if it's more just as long as everything's covered and the vast majority of the funds are going to people within the area. 
as you mentioned, the position thing, I think there's probably a lot of questions that would make sense to, to hammer out. Is this a position that lasts as long as the, until the final recommendation at the end of the TRC process? Was this intended to be something longer term? Is it intended to be 20 hours a week part-time, 10 hours a week part-time? I mean, there's probably a number of things like that, which I don't have a, um, I don't have a recommendation, but just one of those things as you consider this. Um, I think one other thing that hasn't been brought up that's worth considering, and, and um, especially somebody mentioned transparency, which 100% love to hear that. That's incredibly important for everything that we do. Um, but there's also going to be some sensitive areas when we get to the part of the circles and the uh, people sharing their stories. Um, and so also I want the commission to be mindful too as a, uh, as we do stuff that employees for the city or, or us on the council, we have certain requirements for open records and open meetings and all those kinds of things. Um, and that's going to come possibly into some conflict with people who are sharing stories about their trauma. Uh, and, and we don't want to re-traumatize and make somebody. So I think that's a solvable problem, but I'm, I'm hoping, and you guys probably have already talked about this, but just want to make sure that that's something, um, you know, maybe because of my background, the whole like records and meetings and things like that is, is something I, I think of frequently. Um, so that's something too to think about and, and how that will interact with somebody who is a employee of the city versus a member of an outside commissioner group. So that's just something too to throw in the mix because I'm sure you didn't have enough already. <laughs> so. One Oh, sorry. No, I'm One thing that you just mentioned that I don't think that I actually verbalized, but um, it is what I understand from what you just said now, is, you know, could there be multiple people from the community doing some of that project management stuff, if I understood you correct? And I think that that is something that the commission could go back and have a discussion about. And, um, you know, I, I just had, I took a kind of a position that I just wanted to share. And I think the commission um, can go back and have those discussions. Anything else? Um, no. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. All right. All right, great. We are going to move on within our uh, work session agenda. And the next item is the clarification of agenda items. Where did it go? I just wanted, I just wanted to point out in the, in, in the agenda 6A, the, the housing trust fund contribution, not pull it out or anything, but just so that this is the one of, this is the contribution to, of $500,000 that will hopefully be a multiplier through the housing trust fund contribution. All right, July, any other comments about the formal meeting agenda? We're gonna move on to information packet July 14th. Would this, oh, I beg your pardon. Would this be a good time to get an update on the recent meeting on deer management? Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, maybe we, 
we, we can do that now. There's there's a, a recap memo in the uh, July 28th well, IP if you want to wait till that time or we can jump into it now. Well, I have no preference. <laughs> yeah, why don't we wait till July 28th so that if someone's pulling it up, they can get there as well. Any other items from July 14th? We're going to move on to July 21st. Yeah, I just want to mention IP2, which is the, the annual memo on calls for from the police chief and fire chief on fireworks calls for service. It's always, you know, as the, as the state has, has loosened the laws, uh, and it's all it's just becomes increasingly challenging. And this, I think, this points out pretty clearly that large number of calls, yes, but the ability to actually uh, two two aspects: the ability to actually locate the people. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, the, the need to end up getting more specific information, if possible, through the, through the calling process as, as we move forward on this. But it's going to continue to be an issue. Yeah. Uh, it was so hard. I have neighbors. I live in an area where, where if you look at the map, there was, we were kind of triangulated among where a lot of um, calls were. And, and I just, I had many talks with my neighbors and I sympathize and I was irritated and I called and, but the problem is, is that this is sort of like having to know exactly where and when it's going off. Um, and unfortunately, it, tragically, this is also an incredibly busy weekend for m far more serious calls that I think anybody in my neighborhood and, and of the folks that I spoke with would say, yes, the resources are far better put towards um, attending to more serious crimes, even while it's a really distressful situation. But um, it's something that you know, hard choices have to be made. And, and that was something that I tried to explain a little bit. But um, you know, when you're in the middle of things going off constantly, it's, it's hard to, to, to really have that sink in, but I think that post July 5th, um, when things went down, um, people can could rest a little more easy. I think it would also be very helpful in the future if we, if we can sort of think as a, as a group or other people to, to put out, I know that we work on messaging in advance, but to really push out some um, op-eds or messaging on how difficult this is for animals, how difficult yeah. it is for people, for vets and people with PTSD and so, and so, and so many others, and look at it through the, like the human lens uh, as, as opposed to what the state allows or what the state doesn't allow and, and really call on folks to think about that. Yeah, I, I hope, I mean, I understand there were some specific issues this year with, with being able to respond, uh, but I, I did want, you know, I looked at the numbers and I'm sure it, there's going to be some variation from year to year, but this year, you know, 57% of the calls for service were in five neighborhoods. So, um, you know, Grant Wood, Lucas Farms, Northside, Weatherby, and um, downtown. So, and I would say based on you know, my own anecdotal experience that the, the public parks are often the sites where the most activity occurs because it's a larger open space. And so, you know, we're talking about fireworks, not firecrackers. I mean, these are generating, you know, this, the, the sense of explosions um, that are taking place. And so it's when it's concentrated and when it occurs over an extended period of time where it seems like there's no end to it, um, you know, as we, we got some correspondence on this, it was pretty stressful to be in the middle of all that. So, you know, looking forward, I, I would just hope we can solve this issue of location because it, it's, um, again, it, it seemed clear that where, where we were seeing the most activity were in the common spaces within the neighborhood. Not, not the only locations, but certainly some of the more prevalent. Maybe there's some opportunity there with our neighborhood outreach um, position. And as to the point of messaging, as Janice said, even just the basic fact that you can purchase fireworks in Iowa City, but it's illegal to shoot them off in Iowa City, I found myself clarifying that for folks numerous times because that's very confusing. And just hammering that again and again. And I think that brings up a point where I'd like sort of like a tip of a hat to the earlier councils. So when, when these fireworks were first legalized in Iowa, uh, 
councils, many of you were, were sitting here now were there, here then, uh, made it so that the sales uh, was illegal to sell except in very certain places in Iowa City. I know just from my own experience living in Iowa City that, that after that happened, like the following year, the number of, you know, that we were hearing fireworks and the number of complaints dropped off. It wasn't as prevalent. Um, and so tip of the hat to the council for doing that and a wag of the finger at the former mayor of Spillville, Iowa, who took it upon himself this last legislative session, a town of about 300, who was upset that cities like Iowa City had found a loophole to ruin the right of people to fire off fireworks wherever they want or buy fireworks wherever they want in this case. Um, and uh, got that pushed through and got the governor to sign it. And so I definitely, uh, you know, certainly our constituents should reach out to us, but I encourage them to also reach out to the, uh, the, the uh, people in charge of the Iowa House, the Iowa Center, uh, Senate, and the governor of Iowa for, for uh, you know, taking away the, our ability to try and make our community more peaceful um, and not have all of these issues for pets and people with PTSD and, and all of those kinds of things. So I think it's important to know how we got here and people that tried to help that were sitting up here or sitting up here right now and the people that um, took our legs out from underneath us again, so. Anything else from IP um, for July 21st? Going on to July 28th, information packet. And that's where IP6 is the memo about the bow hunt. Yes. Yes. And we're gonna welcome Rachel. Mayor and City Council, um, I can provide a quick update on how the listening session went last Monday. Um, and then if you have other questions about that memo, uh, I can try to answer those as well. So last Monday um, at 5.30 here in Council Chambers, we held a listening session. There were several city staff. We had about nine members of the public attend. And then we had two staff um, from the DNR also attend, two wildlife depredation biologists. Um, we had invited them prior. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, we had nine, peop nine members of the public attend um, and comments and questions and suggestions were shared that really kind of spanned the gamut of the different strategies that are included in our deer management program. Um, we had participants who were opposed to the, to the bow hunt um, who suggested more promotion of non-lethal methods. And then we also had um, other members, especially from certain areas in the community who had really noticed that uptick in deer that um, our data has also reflected. Um, and we're just kind of expressing their concerns, um, sharing that they were hopeful to help the city as much as they could see us be more successful in our bow hunt program or in our deer management strategies in general. Um, and then our DNR um, biologists were also there and able to provide some perspective about how um, new bow hunt programs have gone in other communities in the past. Um, we're certainly one of the uh, new, most new communities to have started a bow hunt program. Um, and the DNR did provide some perspective that you know it, it does take some time to gain that trust, that interest uh, in a community. Kind of along with um, Councillor Harmson's comment about uh, those folks that reside in Des Moines and, and make rules and laws and, and the DNR, et cetera, we as a council had tried over the years to, to have a successful uh, process for uh, calling the deer population. We tried many things, and uh, from what we'd heard, the sharpshooting was the most effective and looking at the numbers now, it's like over the last two years with the bow hunting, only what, four or five, six, <laughs> not very many uh, were eliminated and and it came kind of close to home for me. Uh, I'd never seen deer before, but I came home actually from a council meeting one night, late night and car light shined on the driveway and I thought it was a large dog, but it was a deer in my yard and I'd never seen a deer in my yard before. So I found the comments interesting that perhaps over time, some of the folks that maybe were so, uh, slightly against any culling the deers, maybe are going to see the light and see the increased population when they start seeing more deer in their yards. I've seen a lot of pictures on uh, social media, people like the, the deers are just very comfortably sleeping in their yard and, and mama with the babies. And so it, it, it might take a little bit of time, but perhaps we'll see that over the process. But then we're gonna need the state to realize that perhaps sharpshooting uh, is, is the better method. Do we have any reason to think that the session that we had and the DNR folks who attended would change the minds of those on the Natural Resource Commission? 
to reconsider our repeated requests to sharpshoot again? We met with the DNR, um, which I think is also included in the memo, um, in person in March, and then um, we've, we've kind of stayed in contact th with them since then. They have, um, you know, we've kind of suggested that a sharpshooting option may be something that would work well in our community, whether kind of another one-time or temporary solution as part of a broader plan. Um, so we have shared that. Um, that suggestion with them. They have also shared um, suggestions back to us about how to improve our bowhunt program, how we might um, gain more hunters who are interested, um, how we can help connect hunters with property owners who are interested and have property that is eligible to be hunted. Um, and then they also connected us with um, some contacts from other communities, um, such as Des Moines, a little more urban, a little more similar to us than maybe some other more rural areas. Um, so I also met with all of them and kind of got some good food feedback and perspective of them. Again, that was all kind of focused on how can we make our bow hunt successful because we know that that's what the, the Natural Resource Commission um, has a high priority on, on us ensuring that's an option. So um, we're, we're kind of focused on how we can help build that as part of our overall program. We do have, so it's this bow hunt and then next year's bow hunt, and that's the end of our five-year management plan that the NRC approved. So probably about this time next year, we're going to be working on a new five-year plan uh, to present to the NRC. And, uh, you know, a couple of things. One, I think we have to show that we are taking the bow hunt program very seriously and doing the best that we can to attract hunters and, and provide opportunities. And we're making adjustments each year based on what we learn. As Rachel said, we're trying to learn from other communities. The biggest difference right now um, th that we haven't addressed is the other communities in Iowa um, allow hunting on public ground. We do not. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if that is, is an issue for the NRC when, when the time comes to go back. But clearly the, the, the DNR staff see the numbers, they can see the trajectory, and they want to help us manage the deer in our community the, the best way possible. So I think if we're in a position next year where we have to go back and ask for sharpshooting, I wouldn't, I don't think we'll ever get necessarily back to the point where we can do that every year like we were. Um, but some targeted um, sharpshooting in certain areas at certain times uh, may be plausible as long as we continue to put forth um, the effort to, to grow our bow hunt program. I, I agree with that. I, I do think if we show a good faith effort to, to try to make the bow hunting work uh, and document what those efforts are, um, that, th that we could make the case for reintroducing sharpshooting uh, at, at some point in the near future. But, you know, so I think it's great. We're doing precisely what the plan called for, I'm trying to make adjustments, trying to make it work all in good faith. I, th I think we're, we're taking the right course. Thank you. Any other item? from July 28th. This is uh, really related to IP1. So as mayor, um, so we were all aware earlier, as I mentioned about the Amel Ali uh, situation. And as mayor, I wanted to just kind of get counsel um, if there would be some support for me placing on our agenda on our next formal agenda on August 16th, the removal of Amel Ali from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We cannot discuss it, but um, I can do it independently, but I would certainly want to see at least three people um, that would support that. I would. Okay, and you don't have to, I just need to see shaking of heads. So I will have that on the next agenda. We're gonna move on to University of Iowa student governments updates, and they are not here today. Uh, they're on vacation, as so many people are. <laughs> yes. The next one will be uh, council updates on the assigned boards, commissions, and committees. Ed, don't hear any. We are going to be adjourned until our 6 p.m. formal meeting. So we'll see you in about 22 minutes.